The agenda this week debated the value of government apologies and sat down with the frontrunners in the race to lead Ontario's capital city. The agenda's week in review begins with Toronto Mayor John Tory, followed by his chief rival and former chief planner, Jennifer Keysmat. You had a, uh, a mostly good but occasionally complicated relationship with Kathleen Wynne, particularly when she cancelled the road tolls on you. You've had a complicated relationship with the current Premier. Um, you know, he reduced the size of your city council kind of without giving you a heads up. Kind of. Well, you did. You mentioned that, I think you mentioned anyway, I was at the press conference where you said that he mentioned it in passing at one one-on-one -on -one meeting that the two of you had I mean, in such a way seriously. that no person on earth would have taken it seriously, right. and I didn't because it was not seriously mentioned. But having said that, the first I heard of it was the night before it happened, and to me, what that it did, it's nothing to do with when I heard about it. It's to do with, well, where were the people in all this? Where were they consulted? Where were they asked, you know, what their thoughts were on what the right size of the city council is? Because to me, I have no idea whether the right number is 25, 45, 105, 5. I mean, like, you know, but there was no discussion of that. Okay, the public but, were ignored. Okay, given, given that he apparently didn't give a darn what you right. thought about this, how do you know that you'll be able to have a constructive relationship with him going forward? Because I think that uh, we have mutual interest in making sure that uh, Toronto is strong. I mentioned this earlier on. I think that he wants Toronto to be strong, and that means not just attracting jobs and investment here, which I think is one of his very strong concerns, as it is of mine. And we've had a great track record in the last four years at attracting jobs, and people have said that, well, I don't take credit for that, that I've been a constructive, positive partner in that around the world and here at home. And, and secondly, because I believe that he understands that a connection to the attraction of those jobs and the maintenance of jobs and the connecting up of people who are in some of the isolated neighborhoods is transit and that housing lies at the root. There are people who want to come and invest here who their first question isn't about, you know, sort of what our taxes are. Their first question is, do you have uh, affordable housing that our employees can live in? But let's stipulate you both want a strong Toronto. Yep. He wants a casino on the waterfront. You and don't. I don't. You're right. right. And yeah, that's well, one of probably a so, hundred things that you two disagree about. Well, I, I'm not sure of your numbers, but I mean, I'll tell you this much. What, when did you see any time, you've been following Ontario and city politics for mm -hmm. a long, long time. When did you see a mayor and a premier or a mayor and a prime minister who agreed on everything? And we actually, yes, we, we fundamentally disagree on having a casino, not just on the waterfront, but downtown. I don't think great cities have casinos downtown. I also believe we have enough gambling, including gambling we went along with at Woodbine, uh, because it's going to create jobs in that part of town that is sorely in need of jobs for people, not just casino jobs, but a lot of other development. But yes, we disagree on that. But you're presuming that he is going to follow through and that that's on his big wish well, list of things to do. I'm presuming it because I hear from a lot of people at Queen's Park, Steve, he's got the Premier's job, but the job he really wants to do is John Tory's job. He wants well, to be the premier, and he and he kind of wants to be the, the mayor of Toronto at the same time. Well, that's fine. But you know what? At, at the end of the day, you named one issue, and I told you, yes, I'm very adamantly opposed to that. And I think most of the people of Toronto would be opposed to that and think we have enough gambling here. And we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay. we got a few minutes left here, and I want to touch on one more thing. You're a confident guy. You've been in politics 50 years. I mean, you've been around an awfully long time. And we are talking to you one-on-one -on -one, as opposed to with the other... Um, chief competitor of yours who has a shot at winning this thing. Uh, there's 36 people running and 34 of them don't have a chance to win. But you and Jennifer Keysmat are the two prime contenders. CBC cancelled a debate because your team said that you didn't want to debate her one-on-one -on -one without all the other candidates in there. You, you gave us the same admonition as well. Happy to come to your studio, debate with lots of people, not going to do a one-on-one -on -one with her. Why not? Well, why don't I ask you a question in reply, which is, well, why are you seeking to exclude all those other people who, in good faith, many of whom are very serious candidates... You want to have 36 tons people of their here? Time. No, no. I, and we never said that. We said there should be a representation chosen by the people who are hosting the debate of the other candidates, and that they should be allowed to come on. And I will say this to you. Uh, we debated as recently as last night, and I will say to you, without exception, the candidates who've been included at the choice of those hosting the debates, I believe, have made a very positive contribution I'm sure to the broader true. discussion. What, what are they pulling at? What are they pulling at right now? I don't know. We but, know. But One, I two. will say to you that I've also had lots of ch chance during the mm. five debates I think we have had uh, to uh, have lots of exchanges with uh, my principal opponent. So, I mean, to me... Uh, you know, th this is much ado about nothing. We're having debates. I believe they've been added to by the presence of those other people. And I think it's presumptuous to say all those people. You know, when I ran in 2003, Steve, I started off at 3%, because you were the one that said, what are mm -hmm. they polling at? So at 3%, that's where I started. The first poll that was published, I was at 3%. So I guess by the standards that seem to be applied now, I wouldn't have been included in those debates uh, because I was not polling high enough. And I'd say, well, boy, I would have probably taken some exception to the fact my candidacy, uh, along with any of these other okay. people, has just ruled out. But if we're going on polling, 
there's a, there's a candidate uh, in third place, and nobody's inviting her, including us. We wouldn't invite her either. Yes, and by the way, just so that people know you're not talking in code, I mean, you are talking about a candidate, and there's two of them in the race that have espoused, espoused white supremacist views. Yep. And I indicated very clearly, and I think mm -hmm. I was fair about this, because at the beginning of the campaign, long before there was any debate scheduled by anybody, I said, I have two things. One, I think it's important to have a representation of other candidates take part in these debates. Didn't say who, I didn't say how they should be picked. And two, I will not debate uh, people who espouse white supremacist views. I don't think those views have any place in our politics. I don't. And, and so I haven't debated them. I yes. don't doubt your bona fides on this, but you may be surprised to hear Marcus G. Uh, does. And here's what Marcus wrote in the Globe and Mail not too long ago. He says, your logic is a little rich. The reason that the Tory camp wants to avoid a one-on-one -on -one is that it would legitimize Ms. Keysmat. Voters who haven't been paying attention would see that Mr. Tory has a serious and credible rival. Although this is her debut in politics, Ms. Keysmat is a forceful speaker and a strong debater. People might like her. If, on the other hand, she is on stage with others, then it looks as though she is just one in a crowd of no-hopers. It is the mayor, the well-known incumbent mayor, against the rest. No, you are a former campaign strategist. You're probably doing more campaign strategizing on your own campaign than your people would like. But is he wrong? I would just say to you, the people get to make that judgment. We've had plenty of debates. There's been plenty of exchanges between uh, Ms. Kiesmatt, uh, who I have respect for, and the other candidates uh, involved, and me. And uh, the people get to judge. They watch all of that. They take everything into account in terms of the commitments people make and the re realistic nature of those and who can form partnerships and all the rest of it. And they make a judgment in, in just, uh, just under two weeks from now. This election is about whether we can make our city better or whether we're going to stick with the status quo. What's That's wrong with really the status quo? About. Well, the problem with the status quo is that over the past four years, we have become the most expensive city in Canada in which to rent. Like, we used to, we used to tease Vancouverites and say, wow, could, can't live there, it's so expensive. Well, guess what? It's more expensive now to live in Toronto. That's an incredible risk. 94% of the young people surveyed by the Toronto Real Estate Board have said they're thinking about leaving the city because they don't see a future here. That's new, that's something that's happened in the past four years, and that's a major problem for this city. The other is commute times. We've seen commute times go up over the course of the past four years. In fact, we've now, we're now billed as having the worst commute times in North America. That's a problem. That predates John Tory's time as mayor. It does, but it hasn't gotten any better, and it can get better. Just like housing, it can get better. It's a choice. And then, of course, there's public safety. We've been through a very traumatic, uh, I would say, six months, but it's been building for many years. We have a public safety crisis in this city, whether it's road safety, pedestrians, in particular senior citizens, are getting killed on our streets. We know that cities around the world have embraced Vision Zero and as a result are making their streets safer by design. And then of course there's gun violence, which is part of that public safety challenge. And there's things that we can do at the neighborhood level in order to ensure our city is safe moving forward. So this election is really about, are we going to keep things the way they are? Or are we going to choose leadership that believes in taking swift action in order to set this city on a sustainable course. All right. I, I think it's probably useful to start a little bit with just you, because John Tory has been in public life for many, many decades, and you've been in public life for about two months. <laughs> That's so, right. <laughs> um, you've quite publicly said in the past you were never interested in running for public office, you were very happy sort of playing a role behind the scenes, and then on deadline day, you put your name forward. How come? Well, it's true. I had said that many times before, and it's true that I'm not a politician. I um, And, you know, no one was more surprised than my mum, in part because we've talked about it a lot as a family, my bigger family, but also specifically my family. Uh, it, it's been building over the course of many months. Ever since I left as chief planner, you know it, everywhere, everywhere I went in the city, I was hearing the refrain, I was getting phone calls from media, I was having people approach me on the street and saying, we need a positive, hopeful vision for this city. You can do it. You can deliver something different. And so I was hearing that again and again and again. And you said no to those people over and over and over. I did. I did. I so said, no, changed? no, 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 no. Well, you hit a tipping point. It's kind of like when I was called, I was running my business. I, I'm an entrepreneur. I built a small firm. We had three people. I built it into a national practice with that today employs over 600 people. When I was leading in that firm, a partner in that firm, I got called not once, not twice, but three times by the City of Toronto asking me to become the chief planner. And they 
planted the seed. I wasn't looking for a change. It was never on my hit list to become mm -hmm. the chief planner. And eventually I got my head there and it became a very exciting possibility. And really the same thing happened. I, I would never say there's only one way to get to the mayor's office, because obviously there's any number of ways. But if you look at the people who tend to have the job, you know, as I say, John Tory's been in public life for 30, <coughs> 35 years. Uh, you know, Doug Ford was, excuse me, Rob Ford was on city council for a decade. Mel Lastman had been the mayor of North York, Barbara Hall. I mean, everybody kind of gets here as a result of having been in elective politics for quite some time. Are people, is it a legitimate question to ask, given your lack of electoral experience, are you really ready to take on this job? Well, it's a funny question in some ways because Mr. Tory was the leader of the Conservative Party for five mm -hmm. years. And when he was running for mayor, everyone said, oh, he's never been at City Hall. He doesn't understand. I remember well, actually. He'd run for City Hall those, once before. Well, but he'd never been in a council meeting. Right. He'd, he'd actually never been in the council chambers. You'll remember we that had. That is true. There was a big conversation about that. And in fact, one of my frustrations at City Hall was that I was constantly saying, look, why do we have these three, four-day council meetings? We can run these meetings much more effectively and efficiently. They don't need to be this big mess that they are, but the mayor's the one who chairs that. And I think the challenge is that Mayor Tory has spent a lot of time sort of getting his feet wet, and I can walk right in there. I know exactly how I would change city council meetings. As the chair of city council, that's what the mayor can do to make them more efficient. There's every possibility that even with the slimmed down Toronto City Council that will be elected on the 22nd. It will be a majority of, of suburban as opposed to downtown politicians. It will be a majority of probably councillors who are more conservative than you. And again, I think it's a legitimate question to ask whether you can get anything done that you want to get done, given that there's every likelihood if you were the mayor, you'd be in the minority on council. What's the answer? Well, I don't actually think that's true. Um, and I'll tell you why. The power of municipal government is that it is very fluid. People, you know, they loosely affiliate with parties but not strongly. And we see that on votes. Votes that, you know, go all over the place all the time. And that demonstrates the opportunity for leadership. If you think about a board, I've sat on many boards over my professional life. If you sit at a board meeting, you might have one vote on that board. But when you show up to the board meeting and you have um, an item that you want to advance, you sit down at the table and you convince your colleagues. You bring them evidence and data and best practices. You convince your colleagues and then everyone votes. That's how leadership works. So you think you can convince people in the north end of Etobicoke or the east end of Scarborough to go to see it your way when otherwise they might not? Well, I think it comes back to having a vision. And I think one of the challenges we have right now is we don't have a vision. Keeping taxes low isn't a vision for a city. On November 7th, the government of Canada will apologize to the Jewish community for turning away refugees, as we suggested, on the St. Louis in 1939. Jonathan Kay, does it resonate with you at all? It doesn't. <clears throat> um, I think that the best way that uh, a country could apologize to the extent it has to apologize is by building an inclusive society. Uh, Canada is, uh, in my opinion, among the least anti-Semitic nations on the face of the planet. It's an amazing place to be Jewish. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that is better than any apology. I also just don't think Nations or corporations, are, they're institutional. They don't feel human emotions. When you apologize to somebody, to the extent that it's genuine, that's something a human feels. Uh, you know, Mitt Romney got in trouble uh, on the presidential hustings when he said that corporations are persons. Um, corporations aren't people in the sense that they don't feel emotions. Nations don't feel emotions. And so to, to say sorry for decisions that were made by people who are long dead, it's meaningless to me, and it seems like a political stunt. You remember well the day when Stephen Harper apologized for the residential schools. I do. Was that meaningful to you? I remember feeling very uh, happy <laughs> and proud that uh, this was being acknowledged finally. Um, I was also skeptical because I'm not... Uh, my political stripe is not conservative, so I took it at face value. You did take it at face and value. And I... Uh, I was glad because I saw it as a tool for public education and awareness. I felt that a lot of Canadians had no idea about residential schools. They mm. still don't, and uh, hence why we need to teach it in schools. Um, but uh, I, uh, I, was, I was pleased. After the apology, that's when the real uh, truth came to light, I think, whether they were going to walk the walk or whatever that saying is. Uh, and uh, in my view, uh, they didn't. I felt like in reading the apology and 
afterwards, after I took that time to listen to it, mm -hmm. it was very narrow in scope. It had to do with residential schools, which was extremely important to apologize for, for obvious reasons. But it wasn't um, creating an apology for a colonial past. It didn't acknowledge the fulsomeness or the, the context. And I felt that could be seen as political stunt making if you weren't careful, if you were trying to steer a conversation or steer the, the scope of it. And so we've seen from the outfall uh, or the fallout of the apology uh, with the, uh, their treatment of the lack of implementation of the Kelowna Accord exactly where their mm -hmm. apology was. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review for this Friday, October 12th, 2018. You can see all of those conversations in their entirety at tvo.org, that's our website, or on our YouTube channel, that's youtube.com slash the agenda, or on our Twitter feed, that's twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.